Good. Okay, like I said before, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and it's great to have uh, all of you here today. Uh, my name is Christian Harrison, and I'm a reader in leadership in the School of Events and Creative Industries, and also privileged to be the facilitator of the, res the research seminar. Uh -huh, yeah. And we have had a fantastic series over time, and it's been great to have everyone here. And I think most of us have enjoyed uh, the series that we have had uh, over the last couple of months. And it would have been great for everybody to introduce themselves, but we don't have so much time. And we, we, are, we have so many people here today. So like I always say traditionally, try to use the charts, use the chart, chart to introduce yourself, tell us where, you're, where you are, who you are, where you're coming from, that would be great. I, I think it was one of our speakers that said it, that told us, uh, some months ago, it has become a tradition. Try to introduce yourself in your language. <laughs> so if 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 you're from India, or if you're in China, or from Nigeria, anywhere, just feel free to tell us, introduce yourself in a very unique way. That would be great. Tell us where you are and how sunny or how cold where you where you are is uh, is at the moment. So it's great. So try to use the chat box. That would be great. Like I said initially, uh, don't don't feel you need to be in the digital shadow. Try to, you can put your cameras on, that's not a problem. So you can put your camera, but of course, we know the rules of the Zoom, we've gotten used to it. Try to mute yourself when you're not talking. If you think you, you have to say something clearly, you can unmute yourself. We like to make it very interactive, as, as, as interactive as possible. But of course, if there is a fire in your house, if there is some, if there's an emergency, please, your life is more important. You can leave your computer and leave. Of course, if you need to have a break, that's also important as well. So try to ensure that we do that. But I can see people writing on the chat as well. So please feel free to in introduce yourself via the chat. And as people come in, I would continue to admit them. So hello, everyone. Hello, Imin, as well. So please introduce yourselves via the chat. It'd be great to see where everyone is coming from. But of course, like I said, this research seminar series is hosted by the Business School I'm of the School of Business and Creative Industries as well. And on behalf of our Dean, uh, Professor Dominic Elliott, I'd like to, to welcome everyone. And it's great and it's great, for, for, it's great that all of you are here today. But of course, it's not about me, uh, it's, it's about the research seminar. And like I said, today's research seminar is gonna be a very a fantastic one, no pressure on, on, on Karen, but I have a very strong feeling about this because a lot of people have been in, uh, expressing interest about this seminar. And I would like to tell Karen, thank you, because I know how difficult it was to get Karen here today. Uh, Karen is still not 100% fit, but she decided and, and so told me that she has to be here today. So Karen, I really appreciate it that you are here this, more, this afternoon to deliver this research seminar series, because we have been really looking forward to it. So the topic today was, is gonna be looking at using mixed methods in management research, a tale of two studies. Most times we talk about mixed methods, mixed methods and mixed methods. Sometimes we don't even know why we do it. Most of us want to know how to use it, but we don't even really know about the philosophies, about the paradigms, about the challenges. And today we're going to be having an expert that has used those methods over time. She'll be explaining about the challenges. She'll be talking about the phenomenon itself. Why do we use mixed methods? What are the philosophies behind it? Because sometimes we just use it for using sake. So today we'll be having a clearer insight on the use of mixed methods. But of course, first I'd like to introduce who the scholar is. Her name is Dr. Karen Meha. Uh, I will just try to summarize her bio because her bio is so, is so massive that I will spend the whole day doing that. So I'll just give, give you a summary, a snapshot of what to expect today. She is a chartered psychologist first, with the British Psychological Society. And she's also a senior lecturer in occupational psychology at Nottingham Trent University. Her work specializes in occupational health psychology and in particular, the link between health, well being, and work, how they interact, interventions to improve health and well being in the workplace, especially in high risk occupations. Her most recent work has assessed wearing of body armor in the UK police service, with a particular focus on female officers and was funded by the HSSRC. And she has explored problematic substance use in midwifery 
and of course, shift working on firefighters' well being. So, proud to our training as a psychologist, Karen was employed in occupational health and fitness as an advisor and supports world workforce with emergency services. So, you can see that uh, Dr. Karen Maha has a very strong practitioner experience and also a very strong uh, academic experience as well. She's also very uh, popular and also a chair of one of the special interest groups of the British Academy of Management. And she supervises a lot of DBA students as well. So this is just a snapshot of Dr. Karen. So I'll give Dr. Karen Maha the stage so that she can start the presentation. Of course, the way it goes is that she would present in the next few minutes. Then if you have any questions, please keep them. I can also put them in the chat. There will be sufficient time for you to ask Karen any questions that you have. So Karen, welcome and it's time for you to take center stage. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. That was a very comprehensive uh, overview of my, my career today. I didn't realize I'd done quite so much, so that's great, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, just to say that, uh, unfortunately, I am carrying a bit of a nasty cold at the moment, so I've got a really large glass of water and hopefully I can get through this next half hour, 40 minutes without too much of a coughing fit. Um, but bear with me as I go through just in case I need to mute myself at any point. Right, let me get my slides going. Um, one second. Uh, there we go. Okay. So um, thank you ever so much, Christian, for inviting me to speak as part of the seminar series here at UWS. Um, so I, I do have a connection with UWS. Uh, I um, supervise DBA students uh, at the London campus as an associate lecturer. Um, but Christian's already given you a really good overview of, of, sort of my background. So um, it, some of this bears a little bit of context to what's coming next in terms of the research that I've done. So I'm an occupational health psychologist and senior lecturer in occupational psychology at Nottingham Trent University. But I've taken quite an unconventional route to get to where I, where I am. I completed my first degree in sport and exercise science, so not in management at all, and then worked in the fitness industry for about 15 years, um, where I worked specifically in sort of rehab and getting people back to the workplace, um, and then worked uh, as a health and fitness advisor for the fire service, getting firefighters back to work. Um, I was made redundant and didn't quite know what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided to retrain as a psychologist because that was the bit of my job that I loved. And then went on to do an accredited master's in health psychology. And that was while I was working um, at, at the fire service. So just as I was coming to the end of my master's, there was a huge change program that was being implemented in the fire service that I was working in that was completely changing the way that um, the firefighters were going to be working their shifts, um, that I felt was going to, as a sort of occupational psychologist and occupational health practitioner, I felt would have an detrimental impact on firefighter wellbeing and potentially operational performance as well. So whilst I, I was in that position as a practitioner, I contacted Loughborough University to see if they were interested in doing a research project around this change in shift patterns um, so started this project as a stakeholder in the fire service. But then once the project got up and running, um, there was funding for a PhD studentship. Um, so I kind of put my hand up and said, can I apply? Uh, and I did and went through all of the application process and managed to get the PhD studentship of this project. So it was a bit of a topsy-turvy project because it was already running when I came on board as a PhD student. Um, and also I started my... PhD career a little bit later in life than some of my contemporaries, um, which obviously has then an impact on how I approach the research and all that sort of thing that goes alongside that. Um, and since then, so in my final year of write-up, I took a, a lectureship position at a research intensive university in Coventry, um, and I've now recently moved to NTU. Uh, and both, so my PhD sits within a business school, um, or it did, um, I, I finished in 2018, but my working life so far has been within the School of Psychology, but I am SIG Chair for Occupational Psychology at the British Academy of Management. So my, I'm very multidisciplinary and I sit over lots of different camps. Um, I'm also 
mixed methods as well. So I kind of sit on this strange limbo, no man's land between lots of different disciplines, lots of different methods, methodologies, um, which has really made for an interesting research journey and interesting research career. Um, although it can, it's interesting in terms of work because I'm interdisciplinary, so some of my collaborators see me as, my, as their go-to quantitative person. Other collaborators see me as their go-to qualitative person. And I don't feel I really sit in either of those camps. I wouldn't call myself a, a, a qualitative researcher or a quantitative researcher. For me, it's more about does the research do what I, I need it to do in terms of making a difference to the workers and um, solving a problem in organisations. And so that's the kind of lens that I look at when I come to my research. Um, okay, so the aim of the session, as, as um, Christian pointed out, um, is to present a general overview of mixed methods research for business and management. I was a little unsure about who was likely to be in the audience, so I've made a bit of an assumption um, that it's likely to be, be people who are interested in doing mixed methods research, either for an option of their own work, maybe as a PhD student or an ECR, um, or to support PhD students if you're um, a, a more seasoned academic. So I pitched it very much around the sorts of things that I wish I knew about mixed method research before going into my own project. So I'm going to go start off with a little bit of a general overview about mixed methods research, so the philosophies underpinning it, the types of questions that it's suitable for, um, and then use my own projects as sort of case studies to show how it can be done, and then highlight some of the challenges that that threw up along the way. Um, so I'm hoping there's going to be lots of time for questions at the end, so you can ask uh, any key things that jump out for you. Um, and then if you want to put any questions in the chat, hopefully Christian will be able to, um, to, to pull those together as I go through. So what is being mixed in mixed methods? Well, it can be any or all of these things and different definitions of mixed methods, depending on where you look, may place emphasis on different parts. So there's diverse opinions about what is mixed methods or what isn't mixed methods. Um, and the key argument is around um, that the strengths of each method should offset the weaknesses of the other. So quant research inherently is weak in understanding the context and doesn't directly give participants voice. Um, and uh, the focus on objectivity can mean potential for bias uh, and research and positioning is seldom mentioned simply because it's the most the sort of dominant paradigm. Um, and this, that can be made up for in, in the qualitative uh, aspects of the research. But qual research can lack generalizability um, to a larger group because of the small sample. Uh, and it's more open to bias through researcher interpretation, which then quantitative analysis or quantitative methods is argued not to have. Um, so the, the overarching reason for doing mixed methods is that you're trying to offset the weaknesses of any given method. So key definition, and this is the one that I like from Cresswell and Pino Clark, they feel that any definition should focus on the core characteristics of mixed methods and incorporate these different viewpoints. So their definition includes um, a, a methods, a philosophy, and a design orientation with the central premise that it provides a better understanding of the research problem than any one method alone. Um, and they have some key components that they emphasise that, that researchers should consider. And I'm going to go through these on the next slide. Um, so the key considerations that researchers need to have is that it's around collecting and analysing persuasively both quant and qual data based on the research question. So the key thing is that it's being guided by the research question. It's not doing it simply for the sake of it. So it's integrating or linking two forms of data concurrently by merging them or sequentially having one build upon the other or embedding one within the other. So it's being really clear about how you're integrating and how you're mixing. So multiple methods can be done very separately. Mixing methods means that at some point, these forms of data are coming together to, to uh, give an answer to the overarching problem. So it might be that you give priority to one or both forms of data, depending on the research. You use these procedures in either one or multiple phases of study. And I'm going to go through the different um, options that you have for doing a mixed methods uh, type uh, 
project and what that looks like. Um, and it could be, so for, for one of my case studies, it was one phase that I was researching. It was a longitudinal study and I had the, the same, the, the data collection carrying over the same period of time for both quant and qual. Whereas for the other project, it was much more sequential than that. And it frames these procedures in a philosophical worldview and theoretical lens. So you're stating your position as mixed methods researchers um, and, and being clear about what that is and how you're approaching the data from a philosophical point of view. And then combining the procedures to specific research designs that direct the plan for conducting the study. So you're really clear about how you're approaching this mixed methods research. So you've got a plan of action for conducting the study. So when, it's important to say that um, mixed methods should not be used as a capital. Um, it's, it's key that it focuses on this idea but that a better understanding is achieved by combining methods. Um, so it isn't a case of just scooping up all of the data in the hope that you've got everything that you need. It's, it's about having a, an answer to a research question and a better understanding is achieved by bringing those data, data together. So if the research question is best answered by a single method, either quant or qual, then use that method, then that's what should be used. So what sorts of studies should um, or are best suited to using mixed methods? Well, the first one um, is where my own study fits around the fire service. And hopefully by the end of the session, you'll see how that fits. Um, and you'll see how combining different data methods gave a, a more in-depth understanding of the process. But here it's about one data source not providing a whole story. So a survey might give you the information that you need about um, the effectiveness of, say, a stress management intervention on levels of workplace stress. But it can't tell you what it's worked and why. So the interviews can then provide information on how the intervention was perceived, um, but not whether it made any sort of measurable difference to stress. So combining those two different aspects of data you can get a richer and more holistic understanding of the intervention as a whole. So the next one, um, you can use qualitative exploration to explain quantitative findings. So for example, you could use um, the health and safety executive management standards indicator to run a stress risk assessment within an organization. So that can highlight differences between departments on levels of stress and risk and then use interviews to explore those factors that are associated with the higher levels of group stress. So it might be one department that's got higher levels of risk than the other, and you can use the interviews to try and understand why. So qualitative data could be used to explore a topic that frames a survey to then test a proposed model, particularly useful in topics where um, there's little understanding or there's little research that currently exists. And that particularly fits with the current police project that I'm working on. Um, with the next one is around the secondary method. So the secondary method is typically embedded within the first method. Um, so an experiment with a qualitative component or a case study with quantitative data. So if you were running a case study design and you were triangulating data from different sources, so you've got interviews, maybe observations, some meeting minutes, but you might also use financial reporting or productivity measures to, to add to the richness of that data. So you're using quantitative method, uh, quantitative data that's embedded within your um, qualitative method. Um, the next one also fits with um, my fire service project. So using, um, I use realistic evaluation as a theoretical basis for evaluating the impact of organisational change in the fire service. And I'll go through that in a bit more detail in a bit. That this uses a context mechanism outcome approach. So the interviews provide the rich detail around what worked for whom, how, why, and under what circumstances. And then finally, sort of having multiple research phases can provide a really deep understanding of a phenomena using longitudinal quantitative data such as surveys to enrich sort of um, it will sort of be enriched by focus groups and co-creation methods. Uh, so, for example, you could use photo voice as a way of understanding the facilitators and barriers to workplace physical activity and use those findings to then design an intervention which is tested using quantitative biometric data, for example. So there's lots of different reasons or, or um, types of mixed methods that you can use and different projects that can uh, are suited to a mixed methods approach. 
So the term qualitative research was used as a way of combining lots of different um, rich traditions of research with the key pr uh, purpose of promoting mainstream acceptance within the research community rather than creating a new paradigm. So it's, it's kind of qual qualitative research has become a capsule for any sort of non-positivist forms of inquiry. So then qualitative researchers can position themselves. So this means that, that the idea of quant as objective and qual as subjective becomes a little bit too simplistic and creates a false dichotomy, um, which is where some of the arguments against me I think we've lost Karen. Yeah, I, I think so as well. So uh, let's let's give us some minutes, a couple of seconds. So hopefully she'll be able to come in with these things happen. That's right. Let's see. <clears throat> Okay, so she's she 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 should come back soon. <laughs> Let's see. So feel free to start keeping your questions. Uh, I think it's looking interesting. So any questions you have. You can put them on the chat or you can preferably wait and of course she will be able to answer the questions. So because that's that's the whole idea of the, the seminar as well. So as, as we keep waiting for her, hopefully she would okay. Uh Janan is asking, will you provide the the slides please yes uh the video you even have the video <laughs> so i think the video is going to be available to everyone for everyone that comes in so karen is joining the game so karen is trying to log in so she will join soon after uh next in the next two weeks on the first of december i'll be having another seminar and that will be looking at uh the the, the, the bam employees so that'll be the black asian minority ethnic employees and it's going to be Dr. Mohammed Ishak that will be looking at that. That's going to be very interesting. So watch, uh, watch this space as well. So that's going to be on the 1st of December. So, and on the 2nd of December, we have another event. Not, we're not the ones doing it, but that's a SeedCon fund or SeedCon launch. One of our speakers, uh, if you can remember, some months ago spoke about dementia and they told us that we should apply when the seed corn phone is available. So the launch is gonna be on the 2nd of December at half two. So please try as well to be there because that would be very, very interesting. So that would be a good time to also get more knowledge about grant funding, especially as it affects uh, dementia. Uh, Karen is trying to come in. I think she's having issues with her. She's trying to join, but it's not going well so let's see <laughs> so hopefully karen will be able to provide the slides as well so uh when karen joins i, I think uh people are saying they need the slides so apart from the video i think this i, I totally agree the slides will be important so karen We'll be able to provide the slides and I will share it to every attendee that is here or even those that wanted to attend. So that's good. Thanks. Thanks for that. Karen is still trying to join. Uh, these things happen. So that's uh, the internet. So uh, likely uh, she's having some issues trying to get in. So she's logged out again. She'll come in the next few minutes. So let's see how that goes.
Okay. Yeah, uh, Karen is trying to log in. So she sent me an email saying that she's just trying to get in. So apart from that, but we can continue the conversation and, and wait until... Well, I've got a question. Are you collecting questions for uh, Karen? Yeah, I, I am, I am, I am. So, so, so you can... talking, when talking about mixed methods, yeah. my first question is, which method a PhD student or a DBA student start with? Do okay. they start with a qualitative oh, or quantitative or, or uh, both at the same time? Karen is back. Okay, Karen sorry. Is back. I, 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 Karen is back. So I'm so sorry. I was mid flow then as well. Um, right, let me get back to I, I heard there was a question coming. I'm hoping I'm going to answer that question as I go through. So let me just share my screen again and get back to where we were. Exactly. It happens. Technology happens. Always, <laughs> always has an issue. So that's great. So we're happy that you're back. So okay. keep your questions, Ahmed. Keep your questions every other person. So I think that was, that was an interesting question, Karen, but you can continue with the presentation. Oh, I can't resume my slideshow. One second. Yeah, we're seeing it. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't see it at this end. Of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, right, let me cancel that. I'm so sorry, this technology. And, and Karen, uh, are you happy to share your slides as well? Because yeah, yeah, I'll send them around to you, yeah. That would, that, would, that would be fantastic because. Okay, let me see if this works. There we go. Right, we're back on it. Right. So um, I can't remember where I got to. Did I get to. Uh, I think you were, you, were, you were on this slide, yeah. You were on paradigms. On this slide, yeah. So I was kind of talking around this idea that seeing that uh, quant as objective and qual as subjective is a little bit too simplistic. And there are forms of qualitative uh, data collection and analysis that are more closely aligned with positivist philosophy than a constructivist one. So the semantic boundaries of quant and qual can then cause problems when we think about trying to mix incompatible paradigms, when technically we're not really doing that. Um, so when you're part of a dominant culture, there's really a need to explain yourself and your research um, and, and research within sort of positivist paradigms rarely describe themselves as being positivist. And um, mixed methods often uses pragmatism as an underpinning theory um, of mixed methods, sort of doing away with this idea of any a priori positioning and stating that methods should be framed by who the research is for and how it can be used. But um, as Giddings points out, this might mean that we just risk mixed methods becoming posit positivism in drag, whereby we're using positivist ways of thinking to continue to dominate behind this mask of inclusiveness. So the epistemological positioning of mixed methods of research is still unresolved. Um, and for many PhD students, if, if there are PhD students in the session, if you're going to use it within your PhD, be prepared to defend your reasons, both within your thesis and within your viva, and also do your research on your external. Otherwise, you, you could be in for some in-depth discussions during your viva, depending on their position. So when you're considering quantitative and qualitative mixed methods, it's the type of data rather than philosophical frameworks that you're trying to mix. And that's probably one, one of the best ways to look at it is it's, it's not quant and qual philosophies we're mixing, it's quant and qual data. So this is a framework that I use during my PhD to really get my head around ontology and epistemology. Um, and I can be completely honest, it's probably the hardest bit of my PhD was getting my head around this. I spent many supervisory meetings talking through it. So with ontology being the nature of truth and reality, so it, it could be there's one fundamental reality, objective, um, or there's multiple realities, subjective. And then epistemology being our way of knowing about that reality. So do we um, measure it in an observable way? So objective, or do we access that knowledge through individuals, i.e. subjective? And where you are within the matrix depends upon your data collection and your analysis methods. So for example, you could do mixed methods research within a positive paradigm. So think about content analysis of open-ended questions. So you're kind of counting up the responses in a certain way, um, or um, you, you're trying to get to the, the inherent crux of an issue uh, using open-ended um, open questions in a survey. 
Um, or you could be also uh, mixed methods in this postmodernism framework as well, in frame as well. So using a case study design where um, context and a social constructionist approach is used to interpret performance data. Um, so it's around the type of data that you're using rather than kind of mixed philosophies. Um, and these, these are some of the ideas about how you can do that. And these are some prototypical designs outlined by Cresswell and Plano Clark. And um, they, they presented six, and these are the four um, sort of main ones that, that um, I've presented here. And it does all depend on the question. So be aware that a design can be fixed and predetermined. So, for example, um, for the police project, it was very much fixed and, and predetermined because it was a um, a funded project that was at the Home Office wanted a specific thing, so that's the way it was designed. Um, or it can be more emergent than that, depending on what previous data throws up. So it might be a case of you do a qualitative exploration and then a quantitative questionnaire, and that was in your original protocol. Actually, there's some really interesting stuff that was coming out of the quant questionnaire that you weren't expecting. So you go back to the qual and have sort of a deepening and, and assessing of the results. Um, so it really does depend on the research question about how you design your mixed methods research uh, and it's being guided by that question all the way through. So to, to move on to my case studies, because I realise I've lost a bit of time there by dropping off the call. So to start with, I want to give you an overview of the context and explain the background around the research. That, so this was my PhD research that um, I did um, back in 2014 when I started um, and at the time of the research starting there'd been a um, massive reduction in the number of emergency calls uh, and fire deaths within the UK uh, and the general risk of fires had moved away from domestic dwellings towards sort of more industrial areas um, such as here um, this is the Buntsfield um, this one here's the Buntsfield um, explosion a major sort of oil depot and there'd been a shift in the nature of a firefighter's role to include responding to more um, a sort of a wider variety of incidents such as road traffic accidents and animal rescues etc and there was also an expectation for more community engagement with charity events and safety advice and fitting smoke alarms and all that came with the backdrop of a political drive to reform the public sector within the UK, uh, including the emergency services in the wake of austerity measures and the tough financial climate. And one of these measures was to reduce the funding to the fire and rescue service from central government, which left a lot of fire service making tough financial decisions. Um, and so the fire service in question that I was looking at chose to alter the shift patterns that the firefighters were working on in order to reduce operational costs. So the model of cover that they chose was um, what was called day crewing plus. So the traditional model was two days on, two days off, uh, two, two day shifts, two night shifts and four days off. Um, and it took a um, four watches of a minimum of seven firefighters to cover all the hours at a fire station. Um, and due to the setup of this new shift pattern, the, it required half the personnel to do the same number of hours. So the firefighters were required to work, work blocks of 24 hour shifts with 12 positive hours where they were actively engaged in work and 12 negative hours where they'd be on call from a rest room, um, which is like, these kind of premier in style bedrooms. Um, and they were stood down from active duties, but they could be called at any time. So the st staff self rostered and they could do up to five of these 24 hour shifts on in a row. Um, and that's the bit that I started to get as a, an occupational psychologist thinking this potentially is, is risky for well-being and also operational performance and recovery and things like that. Um, so there were some unique features in terms of families were allowed on station during negative hours, there were private quarters instead of dormitory rooms, and there was a top heavy junior officer structure, so there were more managers, more, more kind of uh, line managers within the station than previously, and there was quite a heavy remuneration for the on-call hours, so they, they got 27% enhancement on their salary to do this particular shift pattern. So it was quite financially, um, it, was, it was a good thing for the firefighters. So the overall research question for the project was, was this one, how has the change in working conditions following the introduction of DCP 
influence work-related well-being and operational effectiveness in the fire and rescue services. So um, I'm just going to unpack it a little bit to hopefully follow my logic and justification for doing these methods. So the research was focused on um, the change, so suggesting a before and after, and how that influenced suggesting that there might be a difference in one direction or another in work-related well-being and operational effectiveness. So the first thing to establish would be whether there was any influence by measuring those things before and after, um, which places an assumption that work-related well-being and operational effectiveness were our objective truths that can be measured. However, this doesn't um, answer the, the how part, uh, and that's where the qualitative element came in. Uh, so that was trying to understand the hows and the whys of the, the change and, and, and any impact it had had. It was a time dependent project in order to follow the change process and the nature of the question led towards a continuous collection of both sorts of data, uh, just simply because of the, the problem that was under investigation. So I chose to take an intervention approach, viewing the shift system as an intervention. So even though I wasn't applying that intervention, it, it was intervening in some way. I followed the process of realistic, realistic evaluation which takes a context mechanism outcome approach. So this takes an interest in whether the interest works or not. So that's the quantitative element, but also appreciates that's dependent upon the decision of the actors within that intervention and the, the um, sense making that they make. So context influences the reasoning of the actors involved. And so by understanding both the context and the reasoning, we can have a richer understanding of what works for whom, how, why, and under what circumstances. And then shameless plug there for my book, book chapter, um, which explains that kind of realist evaluation approach in a bit more detail. So the project was set up as three distinct studies with findings from each triangulated to provide a richer understanding of the process as a whole. So study one was the pre and post questionnaires on work-related well-being measures. Um, Study two was then looking at the performance and operational data, so again quantitative, with study three being the interviews of the operational personnel to understand their experience, their lived experience of working um, this new shift pattern and, and the shift towards this new shift pattern. And then each of those individual findings for each study was then triangulated together to provide a more holistic understanding to the research problem. So in terms of the underpinning philosophy of the project, I situated myself within this kind of area of pragmatism because it, it was the problem that was guiding the methods that I was choosing, but also critical realism um, because it was an understanding that the shift changes through subjective actions um, and um, the individual perception. So my understanding is through layers of human experience. Um, so that, that's kind of how I framed my philosophical positioning for this particular study. Um, and in terms of what that looked like from the flow of the project, and this is just a kind of table to outline how the methods flowed through the project. Um, and it, it was three distinct studies with each having their own uh, research question. So each study had their own individual research question, which fed back into the overarching research question with an individual method for each study and um, an individual analysis for each study. And then the findings coming together to integrate and triangulate towards the overarching research question. So useful advice for any doctoral students in the session, it can really help if you can visually represent your method, not just for mixed methods, um, but for mixed methods, it really helps to show how you're flowing through your project. And I had some practical decisions to make in terms of what order to carry out the analysis. And that was really to prevent, to prevent the kind of contamination of the findings. So even though the qual study is listed as study three, Actually, the analysis happened first because I didn't want my understanding of the quantitative data to uh, contaminate my interpretation and coding of the, the qualitative data. So in terms of the overall findings, the survey data revealed very little difference overall before and after the change, but there were station level differences in, um, in, in certain variables and the spread and variance of the data was indicating inter-individual differences in experience. So therefore the experience of change may be more nuanced 
than sort of crude group level analysis would be able to allow for. So at the operational performance level, there was no overall positive or negative impact, but there were some variables linked specifically to fire engine or fire appliance availability that had negative outcomes after the change. Um, but it was difficult to understand why, because these firefighters were all full-time firefighters, but it was the part-time fire engines that were being impacted. So it was really difficult to unpack why that might be. And then the interviews uncovered how individual firefighters were then framing their working conditions as either demanding or resourceful, with different firefighters framing the same condition differently depending on their own personal circumstances. And as the change process matured, there was a process of reappraisal as firefighters made sense of the new working conditions following their own direct experience. <clears throat> Um, and so the interviews allow for the development of a context mechanism outcome model to explain the firefighters' experience of the change process. And I'm happy to talk through this model for anyone who's interested. Um, but it, it's, it's more to kind of show the framework of how I merged the, the findings together. But then the conceptual model helped to explain the nuance in perceptions between the demands and resources, which is this kind of outcome bit here. So the, the, the interviews kind of helped to understand how the appraisal process was happening, which fed into a larger conceptual framework for the whole project. So anyone familiar with well-being literature may recognise this kind of um, right-hand side here as the Job Demands Resources model by Dick and Demaruti. And this model seeks to predict how work demands and resources influence work performance, either through enriching or depleting cycles. What the model fails to do is understand what makes a demand demanding and what makes a resource resourceful. So on the left hand side was my conceptual framework from the literature, uh, from the interviews to then explain that nuance between the perceptions of demands and resources and therefore build the appraisal process into um, the demands and resources. So in terms of the data from the study informing this overarching model, there's station level data on performance, which is from study two, which is the quantitative part. You've got the quantitative part um, to understand sort of the nomothetic level of well-being. And then you finally you've got the interview data in study three to help explain the outcomes of those previous studies. So it's how all the data comes together to inform this overarching conceptual model. And the second study um, is a bit more simplistic, so it won't take me quite as long to get through, but it still has its challenges, mostly due to the aims and the scopes of the study. So it was commissioned by um, the, the, the STL and the Home Office. So unfortunately, I can't share any specifics of the findings at the moment, but um, it does highlight another way of doing mixed methods research. And the purpose was to assess the impact of wearing body armour in UK police officers with a focus on female specific issues. And the brief was to develop a survey for all operational staff to complete. But the first step in the process was to identify what needed to go into the survey. So the project started with a qualitative exploration of police officers' experiences of wearing body armour. And their responses then informed the item development for the survey. The open-ended questions were also part of the survey to uncover issues that might not have been mentioned in the interviews, but this in itself um, caused challenges for, for the analysis. And there was also the collection of secondary data on injuries and health and safety complaints due to body armour to then triangulate with survey responses. So in terms of positioning, this was much more positivist in terms of its approach to mixed methods, with the interviews designed to identify those issues that needed to be objectively measured. So the open-ended questions were analysed using content analysis to understand the scale of the issue and the strength of feeling in certain directions. So it sits around this kind of neo-positivist approach um, in, in positioning. So in terms of project design, the analysis of the interviews, um, which used template analysis, informed the items of the survey. So this bit here, so the perceptions and experiences of wearing body armour from interviews, then informed the survey in terms of factors. So looking at comfort, fit, performance, wearability. And it also informed what open-ended questions needed to go into the survey. 
and the um, performance issues, the secondary data, and we joined together with the outcomes and the analysis of the survey to then inform recommendations for both procurement, policy, training, and organisational culture. So those final recommendations have gone to the STL and the Home Office um, for their sort of digestion. So there are challenges in conducting mixed method research. As a minimum, um, researchers should be familiar with the found fundamentals of both quant and qual. For quant, there needs to be an awareness of um, methods of collecting data, instruments, open-ended surveys or closed surveys, scales, etc. The logic of hypothesis testing and the ability to use and interpret statistical analysis. Um, there's a need to understand issues of rigor, such as reliability, validity, experimental control, generalizability, etc. Uh, in the same vein for qual, there's methods of collecting data, such as semi structured interviews, focus groups, observations, um, and also the skills needed to analyze that data, developing codes and themes, and an awareness of issues of credibility and trustworthiness and not trying to benchmark qualitative work on quantitative standards, um, moving away from this idea of validity and reliability for qualitative research. Um, it would also be beneficial for specific training on the mixing process by someone who's familiar with it, be, be that a supervisor or dedicated training courses. So for example, for myself, um, I attended a British Academy of Management doctoral symposium on mixed methods, which I, I kind of covered the a philosophical underpinning, um, as well as support from one of my supervisors who publishes um, regularly in this area. Um, and each of the methods takes time to collect data, transcription, cleaning raw quant data. So it can add time and resources to the project. And it's worth bearing that in mind when starting out a, a mixed methods project and having a really clear and realistic timeline, particularly if it is for a PhD project um, to keep it manageable. And then also convincing others. Certainly for me, my personal challenge is um, was convincing collaborators of chosen research design. The police project in particular, it, it was quite challenging because my collaborators were all from the physical sciences. So sit very heavily within this positivist paradigm. So trying to explain to them how qualitative research, what it's there for, what it's used for, the boundaries and the limitations of what you can use it for, um, explaining why I haven't analyzed 7,000 open-ended responses because there simply isn't enough time in the day to do that. So it's a lot of, um, uh, yeah, convincing that needs to be done with anyone that you're working with. Looking at what and when and how to mix, and that really does depend on the research question um, and the study design. Understanding philosophical terms and my own positioning, and knowing that that can shift depending on what the project is. And looking at timings of data collection and analysis, and the, being aware of your own biases as well that come into the project. So my, my kind of final, final thoughts are just let the research question become the guide um, and that will help you then design a, a protocol that fits in order to answer the research question and, and allows you to decide where you're combining whether mixed methods is appropriate. Having a clear articulation of the methods that you've employed um, and that if you're a PhD student, really doing that well in a methodology or research strategy chapter and if you're writing a paper as well you need to convince your reviewers as to why mixed methods was the most appropriate way to to do this project and then think about skills audit and training so if you're a mixed uh, if you're a phd student thinking about do you have a weakness in your methods if you're looking at doing a mixed methods research project where do I need to do my training in order to make sure that I'm upskilled to an equal level on both paradigms or both data collection methods? Or looking at if this is, um, if, if you're not a PhD student, thinking about collaborations, where can you draw on other people's strengths in order to get a really good niche um, uh, and expert uh, project? So thank you very much. And I apologize for dropping out of the call for a few minutes, but hopefully there's still time um, for some questions before before the session ends. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. I think it was a very great presentation, very insightful, very informative. And we, we got to know so much about uh, the mixed methods. And I can see that a lot of people are making comments on the chats as well. So thanks very uh, much for that. So what I will do before we go to the questions on the chat, anybody that wants to ask a question 
uh, the ones who ask a question normally. So this is the time for you to ask questions. I know the session is meant to end by half two, so we still have time. So we still have like 35 minutes. So any questions that you have before I go to the questions on the chat? So uh, we'll start with Baba. Okay. Then, okay, is that, okay, we'll start with Ababa, then we'll move to Ahmed. Okay, Baba. Oh, hi guys. Um, My question to Karen, I think you touched on it a little bit, but you didn't then elucidate a little bit further. You said the, the biggest um, hurdle when it comes to mixed methods is your estomology and your ontology part. Yeah, the obvious one, like I said, <clears throat> is always the pragmatic approach, which through reading, I'm a PhD student, by the way. So through reading, there seems to be a fatigue in the research community that everyone who does mixed approach always goes for practicing. Uh, I've opted for a different one. And I was hoping you could give us more information about it. The transformative paradigm, which avoids all the pitfalls of just going in, being pragmatic about the whole thing. So my question is, can you, do you have any information or anything that you want to add on picking a transformative paradigm in a mixed methods approach? I must admit, um, I, I'm not aware of that one. So um, yeah, I don't know. Could, could you explain a little bit more about how that avoids the pitfalls? Basically, uh, with your transformative paradigm, it came up with, uh, I think her name is Mertens. Basically, she gives you, there are like six points that you should have within your research. And those points, are, or frameworks rather, if you should research along those lines, there's issues like advocacy that should be included in there. There's you wanting to bring change. So it kind of guides you instead of you running around, you know, trying to be, for a lack of a better word, trying to be pragmatic and just finding what works. It kind of has six dimensions to a framework. Um, I don't have my notes with you. I could have listed all of them to you. So it kind of guides you. But again, like you said, there's so much little literature out there <laughs> when it comes to ontology and epistemology for mixed methods. Yeah, it, it, that, that from listening to you talk about that transformative paradigm, it does seem to fit with the kind of practical approach. It's like, that it's what data do I need in order to answer this question or, or make a difference? Or, and so it, it seems along that, and I suppose it depends on how you're viewing pragmatism and um because there's different different ways of looking at pragmatism ultimately i think there's still a there's still a need if you're a phd student to identify how you are framing your ontology and your epistemology so is the phenomena you're looking at is there an objective truth are you are you trying to get to some underlying objective truth do you, do you feel that whatever phenomena you are looking at um exists in some way uh or are you looking at it more from a social constructivist point of view um and and seeing things from multiple perspectives because i think until you the, the risk the downside of pragmatism and from what sounds like the, the transformative approach it, it doesn't set out how you're viewing your phenomena um so even though it, it, like for my phd i use pragmatism there was still a need to convince my my examiner how was i viewing well-being how was i viewing demands and resources Do, did i see them as multiple truths or did i see them as one overarching objective truth so i think even if you're using that paradigm this, there might still be a need to identify um, how you're ontologically positioning within your phenomena. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, it does. The good thing that I did actually did contact the actual person who wrote it. She's from, I think, uh, Caltech. <clears throat> anyway, like you said, it's maybe for a different discussions on a different day because the questions that I had were follow ups to if you had an idea on it. But yeah. I hope I'll get contact you to, to, I hope to contact you directly, then we can speak some more. Yes, absolutely. No problem. Thanks, thanks very much, Baba, for that. Of course, you can contact uh, Karen directly. I can see that you you definitely need uh, Karen's more insight from Karen about your transformative paradigm. So that's great. Thanks, Baba, for that. Then we have Ahmed. Ahmed, your, your questions. Thank you. Karen, thank you. That was very, very informative and comprehensive presentation. I One 
main uh, issue I have with my own students, they would come always and say, I like to use a mixed method. And I say, why? <laughs> I said, it looks nice because I could present histogram, diagram, and all that, and then compensate, you know, the qualitative part. I said, no, that's not the purpose. And then going back and they say, tell me what is your research question? And then you explained it very well. You, man you, know, you showed us how you managed to mix the qualitative question and the quantitative needs to be answered in a, a piece of research. That's fantastic. That's what my students, I want them to learn. I want them to do. They just jump straight to the research and they have no idea where they're going without having a question to answer that dictates you know, what design they should use. Um, so coming back to your, your research question is fantastic, is clear. Now you've got three studies. And it shows very well the, you know, the research question there. And then I, I, I might assume that those research questions are the sub questions it, as it is from the main one. That's what I understood from it. Yeah. The other one, what I did not, uh, I wasn't sure about uh, in your quantitative part, I didn't see. Did you use the same sample of participants, the same people for the quantitative in your studies, or did they change? That's one thing I didn't catch. The other one, uh, the, the smaller part of the question is, your integrated conceptual framework is fantastic. You, you showed you know, the inter the, both the qualitative and the quantitative, but I did not see in your quantitative part, in the conceptual for framework, the cause-effect relationship, although you mentioned there is an influence in your research, main research question, the central research question, you mentioned that, but in your, in your conceptual framework, I did not see it, and I did not see the hypothesis. So I wasn't sure, probably those details, you know, you didn't want to include them in your presentation, or so I'm not sure about, so. But this is why I'd like my students to learn, you know, departing from the research question, that dictates to them what design, going for qualitative simply or quantitative or mixing both. And what they should have, you know, you should be able to explain that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I think it's one, one of the, um, sorry, I'm about to cough again. I'm just gonna put myself on mute. Yeah, it's one of the challenges with students is, is getting them to think about the research question first rather than jumping straight into the methods. Um, and I had some fantastic guidance there, which has got me to this really clear research question. Um, to answer your first part, the, the participants were all the same, simply because it was a, a change process that impacted on this group of people. So I was following this group of people. So in terms of if you read up about mixed methods research, they're saying, oh, you shouldn't use the same sample for your quant and your qual. Well, for this project, it was simply because it was the nature of the phenomena that I was I was investigating. Um, so, yes, I, I was looking at the same participants. Uh, with regard to the second part of the question, that was uh, all oh, remind me. Remind me of the second part of the question. <laughs> I think it was about the hypothesis. Oh, hypothesis, yeah. So um, I didn't have any real firm hypotheses. It was an exploratory study, simply because when I jumped into the literature, I had some literature saying this will happen, and then some literature saying this will happen, and there was no real clear direction to put my hypothesis. So my hypothesis was that this change is likely to impact on people. I just don't know which way it's going to go. So it was much more exploratory than, than having a firm hypothesis. Um, the, with the uh, performance data, again, it was the, the, if on my slides, when I did the triangulation, I had a firm line between two of the variables or factors um, and then dotted lines between the others. And that was simply around the strength of the literature. So the strength of the literature between well-being and um, 
uh, well-being and performance is quite strong. But the the literature between um, oh, I can't I can't remember the slides now. Um, let me bring that up. So the the literature between working conditions and well-being is really really strong. Um, but the literature between operational performance and working conditions is a bit weaker. And because of that, that then impacted on the quality of my hypotheses. They were much more exploratory. Um, and at no point in my thesis do I make any claims about cause and effect, simply because my participants, there weren't enough of them. My sample size wasn't big enough. So it was, it was very much based around this idea of this is an intervention rather than I'm investigating the impact between these two variables. Uh, thanks very much, Karen, uh, for that. And thanks, thanks Ahmed, for the, the insightful questions as well. So there are a lot of questions on, on the chat. I will start with the question on the chat. Uh, if Janan wants to, Janan can also come in as well. Please, can you say something on abductive method and what it represents in the mix. I think Janan wants you to talk about uh, the abductive approach uh, to, to reasoning. So I think, Janan, are you there? Okay. So I think Janan wants you to talk about the abductive method or the abductive approach yeah. to in reasoning. What way? What, what is it that, that you wanted to know? So Janan, what do you want to know? Okay, I learned one thing today, even at my, okay. <laughs> I think maybe, uh, of course, there's reductive, inductive, and abductive. So I would think maybe he wants he wants to know whether the abductive approach is more suited for a mixed method. Uh, to, for a mixed method, I think that's what Janan is trying to say. That if you're trying to say, okay, we have an inductive, most people say, okay, an inductive approach is more qualitative. Yeah. An inductive approach is more quantitative. And people say the abductive approach as a combination of both is likely to be a mixed method. So maybe he wants you to, to, to say whether that is what my, he also yeah. so my, my thinking there is um, if you think back to the sort of the, the two by two matrix of your, your paradigms, it, it all depends on where you're sitting because you, you could have a really inductive um, mixed method study that sits in a so, social constructivist paradigm um if even that you you might be analyzing quantitative data but from a sort of more inductive approach so i think it all depends on what your research question is and where where you position yourself philosophically as to whether you would use inductive deductive or abductive um so yeah i i i would say go guide be guided by your research question and and the over overarching aim and scope of your study um, and that will let you decide which is the better option. Okay, thanks very much Karen for that. I think another question by Prena, uh, Prena, Prena, if you're here you can still, you can contribute to it if you want. How is mixed method different than triangulation? I think that's what Prena is asking. Okay, so you, you don't necessarily have to have mixed data in triangulation, so you could triangulate all qualitative data from da different data sources. So the point of mixing is that you're using different um, data collection types, either quantitative or qualitative. So you're, you're mixing those different data types. Um, you triangulate when you've got different data that you're then bringing together. So you could triangulate different sources of quant data but that's a quantitative project, it's not a mixed methods project. And you can triangulate different sources of qual data in a case study, but that's not a mixed methods project, that's, that's a case study in a qual project. So triangulation is just the process of bringing the different data, uh, different analysis of different data together. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, Prana, are you happy with that? Are you okay with it? Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that, thank you very much. <laughs> no no yeah, problem at all. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Karen, for that. I think uh, a lot of questions in the chat. I think many people are, are more comfortable putting the questions in. Uh, Janan, question by Janan. I think I think it's almost similar to what you have said already, but you had written the question before. So the position, the philosophy, the positive philosophy. So in this case, one one could then position that philosophy as positivist and have mixed data. I think Janan is trying to say, is it possible to have a positive philosophy 
and use a mixed method approach? Absolutely. So my second project is very much in that paradigm. Um, so it's it's identifying the issues around um, body armor wearing from a, a, a using qualitative interviews, but I'm using content analysis, which sits very comfortably within a positive framework, a positivist paradigm. So absolutely, you can do a mixed methods project with with a sort of positivist lens. Um, so again, it's all get it's about that research question being guided by the research question and, and and what it is that you're trying to find out. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think question by Alexandra. So Alexandra, you could you could yes. You could yes. Question. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, Karen, um, for your uh, wonderful presentation, lots of depth. And because of that, it just makes me think, because of all the complexity that is involved in the mixed method research, do you think as educators, we should actually discourage our undergraduate students to be using the mixed method um, approach? Good question. Personally, yes, I always do discourage my undergraduate, even masters, I try to discourage. Um, mm -hmm. Simply because of the time, if for pragmatic reasons, more than getting their head around anything else, it's it's they don't have a lot of time in which to collect this data. Um, so to be able to do any method well, it's probably best to focus on a single method. Um, and we don't, certainly at NTU, we don't teach undergraduate students the philosophical underpinnings of, of research. We, we very, very basically scratch the surface. So for the, for the students to do it well, they just haven't got the foundations there. So personally, I would definitely discourage undergraduates and um, most of my masters, to be honest, from doing mixed methods. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I share that opinion. I think that it's at that level, it's simply not possible realistically to implement even just allow students to have space for thinking about that. Yet we, we actually still enable very often to, to let students perhaps struggle. Um, but um, thank you very much for sharing your views. Yeah, sometimes it's cool to be kind. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thanks very much, Karen, as well. It, it's strange, isn't it? that you're saying you're being very truthful with us saying that don't do it if you're an undergrad student so it's always like okay do it because i'm doing it we're telling them okay don't do it because it's not going to be easy so thanks for that so anybody that's providing undergrad students uh, karen is telling you please don't encourage your undergrad students to do it because it's not going to take it's going to take a lot of your time so that's great uh, thanks uh, alexandra as well another question about emmanuel so Emmanuel, you can jump in if you want how feasible is the mixed methods for prof doc students? So Emmanuel is asking, how feasible is the mixed method for doctoral students or for people that are looking at it from the, the, the prof doc uh, students? So that's what Emmanuel is asking. Yeah, I think it depends on the um, project. Again, I'm going to go back to this research question guiding everything. Um, and so I supervise on the DBA program at, at UWS. And I have two of my students doing a mixed methods uh, study. Um, and what I found was the students were very comfortable in one domain, but not the other. So I suppose it really does depend on the how comfortable the supervisor feels in supporting that student in the whole mixing process, whether there is um, training available for them to upskill their weaknesses. Um, in terms of making sure they've got all the skills that they need to be able to do it effectively. Um, and prof docs are often, um, well, I know the DBA is full time, but there are prof docs are often done whilst working at the same time. So there's pragmatic decisions around, around it as well. It is feasible. Um, it, it's a little bit more challenging than with a PhD, I think. Um, but if, if the research question um, is suitable and the student feels comfortable and the supervisor feels comfortable I, I wouldn't I, I would say it'd be absolutely fine thanks thanks for that thank uh, you thank you Karen. thank you okay, Manuel, okay, Manuel is here so that's thanks Emmanuel for that as well so we have other questions uh I think another one by uh Colapo. so Colapo, you could you could jump in if you want or I could read your uh, question Karen, I'm a prospective PhD student and my proposed research is looking at ethical values in the accounting profession. My research is adopting an interpretivist approach 
But one of my objectives is looking at impact of ethical training on professional accountants perception of ethical value, which is quantitative in nature. How best can I go about using a mixed method for my research? Okay, so that does sound a little bit like the interventionist approach that I explained in my in, in my um, PhD. So it might be worth looking at something like realist evaluation, because if you're going to be doing a training program, you, you want to be able to understand whether it's made a difference. So you do want a quantitative analysis, but then you also want to understand the whys and the hows of that. So I would recommend looking at realist evaluation um, by Pawson. Um, or any any work by um, Karina Nielsen, uh, who does a lot of work around interventions and evaluations, evalu uh, evaluating designs, training programs, etc. I think that would probably give you a good standing point about how you do that. And it is from an interpretivist um, point of view because you, you are interpreting the perceptions of your of your participants and evaluating those, even though you're using quantitative data. Thanks very much, uh, Karen, for that call up. Are you okay with that? Okay, I think call up boys should be okay then. So the next question is by Nuro. What do examiners look for or expect when they ask us the reason for using mixed method research? So Nuro wants to find out what examiners look for or what they expect when they're trying to justify the use. I think this is a typical uh, Viva question. Yeah. <laughs> so why, why did you adopt a mixed method research? Yeah. That's a really big question. There's a, a lot of pressure for me to answer for every single examiner in the country. I think the main thing that examiners look for is that you can justify your position. So making sure that you understand why you're doing it um, and what, what purpose it has within answering your research question. So that means understanding your philosophical positioning, um, understanding what methods that you're using and why. So you're having a really clear justification of why mixed methods is the most appropriate way to, um, to, to answer your research question. Um, and that will depend on your project. So again, that would be about having those discussions with your supervisor. If you're looking at a mixed methods project, um, to, to have those kind of in-depth discussions around ontology, around epistemology, uh, around your methodology, to make sure that you really understand why you're doing what you're doing and you can justify it in a really confident way in your, in your viva. Ultimately, examiners don't necessarily have to agree with you. They just have to, they have to believe the, the, the argument that you're putting across. So it's about justifying, really justifying what you're, um, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Karen, for that. And I think uh, that question has been answered. Another question by Elaine. Elaine, you can, you can come in if you want, or I could read your question, Elaine. Are you, are you okay for me to read it or you wanna come in? Hi, Christian, I'm happy for you to just read so that my little girl's off school sick today, so I wouldn't subject anyone to, to a tantrum. <laughs> no problem, no, no, I'll read it. So thank you, Karen, for your presentation, very informative. My current research will employ a mixed method approach, and I would like to ask, given your experience with mixed methodology, do you think that a mixed methodology or mixed method research has to be more comprehensive or robust than that of a single method? in order to offset any skepticism of the design. So I think Elaine is asking about the robustness. Yeah, that, uh, that's a really interesting question. I think you have to, you have to justify yourself more, I think, when you're doing a, a mixed methods project. Um, and, but I, for, for me, if you're doing science well, you're, you're doing a robust and um, rigorous project, regardless of whether it's quant or qual. I just think you, you have to justify yourself a little bit more when you're doing it mixed methods. Um, and I think the purpose of mixed methods is that you, you should be offsetting the weaknesses of each method. So um, when you're looking at sort of the, the if, if, so for example, I'll give you an example from my project, my sample size was really small. So therefore I, ha I had very, very limited generalizability. So I had to be really careful about the claims that I was making, but that meant that my interpretive interview, st interview study helped fit, helped plug that gap by giving an understanding of what my participants' experiences were. So it was about, um, it's about knowing 
the limitations of your project and how each method then plugs those gaps um, to give you the most robust and the strongest um, project possible. But I do agree that when you when you are working, I think it's a little bit around how I how I see myself as a researcher is I do feel like when I'm in a quant circle, I'm justifying myself as a qual researcher. And then when, when a qual circle, I'm justifying myself as a quant researcher. It's like I, I, I don't fit in any camp. So I do feel like I'm justifying myself a lot. Um, but I don't think robustness is any any more it needs to be any more robust than you would do any other project because if you're doing science right you're, you're doing robust science anyway yeah uh, thanks very much karen for that like questions are coming and uh, thanks elaine for that i think your question has been answered elaine so we'll go i think baba wants to ask a question and he, baba has been sending me a message and after that muzama will also ask a question as well and we have one question on the chat before we end so baba Okay, Karen, um, mine goes back to the actual work on the ground. Obviously, with PhD, you are kind of coming in with the prior knowledge and prior assumptions because of your literature that you've read. So my question is, how do you prepare, if any, that your qualitative data and your quantitative data don't agree? And worse still, if they're on a complete tangent with your read literature do you throw away your whole phd <laughs> do you reassess do you what do you do because i'm at that stage so i'm crossing my fingers but what's at the back of my head is what's going to be on the paper if you know what i mean okay so so let me just make sure i've got this right so you you, you want to understand how you stop your quant and qual influence I'm not stop because that will be <laughs> you're not doing the proper, proper research where if you're going to just try to because I would have said how do you need to get so I had to retype that so my question is is there anything that you can do beforehand I know that's the wrong words to choose but I'm saying how do you prepare if your quant, your quantitative data and your quantitative data your qualitative and your quantitative do not agree and worst case scenario both information not agree with the literature that you already had I, I think that's a really interesting position to be in and it would be a case of trying to unpack why that is. Um, quant and qual, it doesn't necessarily have to agree. It's, it's, it's about trying to understand what's going on in your data. Um, and I, I don't think if, if it, I think it all depends on what type of analysis you're doing. So trying to bracket off literature, it, it that's part of grounded theory, but inherently it's really difficult to do because ultimately your understanding of the topic will inform your interpretation. And that's all part of the research process. I think as long as you, you're reflective on that, and I think being reflective is a strong part of, of mixed methods as well, reflecting on the process, reflecting on potential biases and influences. Um, and I think it's a, it'll be a case of trying to understand where, why these contradictions and complications are occurring um, and it could be around doing an, an extra layer of analysis um, to try and understand what what's potentially going on in in the in the data um, without knowing your data it's really difficult to advise and it might be a, a good discussion for one of your supervision meetings but I think it, just because things don't agree if things don't agree with the, the literature, if things don't, if the quantum qual don't agree with each other, that's not necessarily a bad thing. For me, that's an interesting thing. And it's about unpacking why that might be and going back over the data and, and trying to understand why. All right, thank okay. you. Thanks, thanks, Baba, for that. And uh, Moose had a question as well. So Moose, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Karen, for a wonderful uh, presentation, and I really enjoyed the discussion here. So I think my question was, will be really about the experience. What are the main challenges you faced while you were doing your, say, PhD or mixed method research? Was there any, you know, point when you said, "Wow, well, I'm dealing with, you know, why I'm doing this? You know, was there any, you know, time when you felt that and how did you overcome that stage? Because I'm sure there's so many like PhD students who are at that stage, like questioning you know, they, why they're doing mixed method. So I think I just wanted to hear about your experience uh, on that. 
Yeah. yeah. So I think there are two main challenges that I had. Firstly, was the 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 wise, the philosophical side of things, and having come back to um, study a little bit later in life than some of my contemporaries, it took me a long time to get my head around it. And um, uh, one of the first challenges my PhD supervisors set me was to justify mixed methods research that was one of the first bits of writing they gave me even before I'd done the design or anything like that they were just like right I want you to write an essay on justifying mixed methods research so that was like the first process of trying to understand how the epistemology and ontology of it all went together um, and that often is quite a challenge for, for um, PhD students to understand that part of it so lots of discussions with supervisors, going to training sessions. The, the BAM Doctoral College was, uh, the BAM Doctoral Symposium was fantastic for that. There was lots of discussions around mixed methods research. The other challenge that I had was in convincing others. Um, <clears throat> so um, my external examiner was a uh, mixed methods researcher. So that was fine. It was my internal, my internal examiner was a sociologist a social constructivist. So for the, for me, it was convincing them around the quantitative element of my project. And uh, <clears throat> one of the changes they wanted me to put in my PhD was about bringing in um, a, a very social constructivist element and it just didn't fit. Uh, so there was a lot of, excuse me, I'm gonna cough again. <laughs> So convincing others is a big challenge as well, particularly if you're working in a collaborative team. Um, for the police project, I'm working with physical scientists. So trying to explain to them what quality means in, quant in qualitative research in terms of truth, uh, trustworthiness and uh, credibility and that kind of thing um, in language that perhaps they're not used to can be really challenging. Um, so, it, again, it's just having a really clear understanding from your perspective, so you're, you're then able to um, fight your corner and justify things uh, is probably a, a really good position to be in. But that simply comes from really understanding both, both camps. So you, have, you need to have a really good understanding of both camps so you can justify um, where you sit and, and how you approach things. Thanks, thanks, Karen, for that, and thanks, most for that question. And the final question, because I can see we just have two minutes left, and that's by Noreen. Uh, can you mention something on the difference between mixed methods and mixed methodology? I've seen some people are using multiple methods and calling it mixed method research. Is it right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's quite a complication and a conversation in the literature about this. So for me, this is only my perspective. Mixed methods is about the, the methods that you're using should be from two different data collection types, quant and qual, and the findings at some point mix together. So you're using them together to understand the phenomena. Multiple methods are much more parallel. So you're, it might be that you're, you've got one research question that's focused on qual and one research question that's focused on quant, and you, you might, you might discuss them in a discussion section, but ultimately they sit separately. So they're kind of two islands separate. So for me, mixed methods is uh, the two different data collection types, quant and qual, at some point merge together to create a greater and um, richer understanding of a phenomenon. Hey, uh, I think that's answered Noreen's question. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Karen. I can see, of course, you're not 100% and you're and you are still able to come here and did a fantastic one for us. I think from the chats, everybody's really appreciative and very positive about the session. And uh, thank you very much for coming. We know how busy you are. And thanks everyone for attending. It, it was a great session. It was great to, to learn much more about missed method. And thanks for, it, for spending your time to be here. I think Amanda is saying fantastic session. Alexandra has said so much as well, even Muslim also, a lot of people have said, even Elaine as well. So thanks uh, for the positive feedback. Next, in the, in the next two weeks, we'll be having another session on BAM employees and their working experience. So please ensure that you attend that. So watch this space, more sessions, but of course, I think Karen has raised the bar and hopefully 
and I'm sure that Mohammed will be able to do something about it as well. So thanks everyone for attending and on behalf of the Dean and all other colleagues of the school, we'd like to tell you thank you and hopefully we'll see in on the 1st of December. So thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. <laughs>